Final speaker is James O'Connor. James is a philosophy major with us in the department. He's also our senior of distinction for this year. He's a graduating senior. James will be presenting his original research entitled, Could Immortality Be Worth Having? That is a great title. So thank you. Thank you. Um. So um, Aiden kind of addressed you know, when would life be worth ending, possibly, and I'm going to be uh, kind of addressing when would life be worth uh, continuing uh, indefinitely. Um, and uh, as my wife knows, I can go on about her mortality forever, so I'm just going to start my timer here. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you uh, to the department for having this, and thank you for everybody here. So, um, so could her immortality be worth having? Um, another way that um, is kind of popularly um, arrived at this question is um, through contemplating the badness of death. And so um, philosophers have um, been engaging mostly with Epicurus and then um, Lucretius, a uh, Greek and then Roman philosopher, um, who uh, kind of famously and sort of provocatively claimed that like death is n not a harm to you. It's not something that you should ever really be considered, uh, that you should really even worry about. Um, because uh, as Epicurus says, um, when you are there, death is not. Um, when death is there, you are not. And so um, he sort of says that like, you're, you're mistaken if you think that death is something to be feared because it's just this non-existent uh, state. Um, but um, it's philosophy, so not everybody agrees um, with that. So um, also, um, one of the reasons I think immortality is worth um, engaging with as a topic is that um, it, it's promised pretty ubiquitously in, in major world religions. Um, and even a lot of secular people, I've just been talking with people about this um, pretty nonstop. Um, a, a lot of people want immortality, um, but um, philosophers like uh, Bernard Williams and Shelley Kagan says, like, if you had it, you really wouldn't want, want it if you, if you got it. And so a pretty um, hotly contested uh, debate around this. Um, but uh, uh, Thomas Nagel um, in Mortal Questions um, pretty strongly suggests that um, uh, immortality would be uh, good worth having, and basically, um, since since death is bad, in his opinion, um, he counters Lucretius as does um, Williams um, and, and disagrees and says that death is really bad. And mostly, um, death is bad because of um, what it deprives you. Um, and they both sort of disagree in in, in a kind of a subtle way that I think um, directs the the nature of their discussion and. So for Nagel, it seems that um, what you're deprived of from death is more of the opportunity to experience the good and bad things of life, right? You're, you're, you're deprived of just the opportunity for experience. And for Williams, you're, you're, you're deprived of the good things in life specifically. Um, and so fr from this, Nagel kind of dr draws that immortality would likely be a good thing. Um, and that um, Williams and then uh, Shelley Kagan um, in, his, in his book Death and his Open Yale course, says, no, not even an ideal version of immortality would be desirable. So, so what might be an ideal version? Um, and so um, you, uh, contrasted to this might be the thought in like Gulliver's Travels, where like um, Gulliver finds a, a, a race of people that um, just don't, uh, they never die. And he's like, oh, how great. But, but they still age. So then eventually they just sort of become you know, shells of themselves. They're just decrepit, their, their facilities go. Um, and so that's not a kind of immortality they might want. So, so Kagan says, you know, you can live hell hardy and he uh, healthy and you, we'll give you whatever you want. you want. You want money, you want money, you want other people to be there, we'll give you that. You still wouldn't want it. Um, and so Williams essentially says that um, one of two things will happen. So he presents you with a dilemma. He says that um, eventually boredom will just erode any meaning to your existence and that um, you just get tired of the things that you like to do eventually, right? Or what you like to do will change sufficiently enough that you're essentially a new person in his eyes. And so um, goals and desires are very, um, you know, um, primary to his view of personal identity, right? So if, um, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to um, look out for other people, and I like to study philosophy, et cetera, and then uh, two, three hundred years on, I uh, adopt these new, you know, new ideas and new person, all of a sudden I don't like helping people, like, and I, I hate philosophy, and I'm just into engineering now. But, you know, for Williams, I might be sufficiently enough of a different person that, that this type of immortality still hasn't kind of given me what, like, I here now want, and that's something sufficiently like me surviving through time, right? 
Um, and so like you can also say like if you had sort of progressive memory loss, um, every hundred years your mind got wiped, so you never got bored that way. That still wouldn't give you what you wanted. And so you would fall into you know, pr prong two of the dilemma, right? So um, for my part, um, I'm mostly staying away from this for my paper. I'm not wading into the territory of, of personal identity for this. I, I think that there's plenty to talk about in um, just taking issue with, with prong one, that people would get bored from these types of, of things. Um, my, notion of per my personal notion of personal identity is a lot fuzzier than I think uh, Williams's is. And so I'm just kind of avoiding that mostly altogether. Um, so just a couple starting points. So I'm um, basing this mostly on Williams's um, paper on the Macropolis case, uh, and this uh, deals with Alina Macropolis, who is a um, fictional uh, story, uh, a story about a fictional person based on a play. And uh, she's 42, and she gets an elixir by a physician, and basically gets to live um, indefinitely. Um, the elixir lets her live 300 years, frozen at 42, which Williams describes as a fine age, and he's basically about 42, and he's get, giving this a little little back padding. And, uh, and says that's a great age um, to, to live. And then eventually she gets bored. She says singing or silence, it's, it's all the same. So like everything that she had joy in in life. And so this is what Williams is essentially arguing is that eventually you get to a point where life is just sort of happening to you and that that is what erodes the meaning from your existence, right? Um, and uh, Williams, um, in the beginning, after refuting uh, Lucretius, um, he he uh, defines two different types of desires, right? And he has these conditional desires, and these are things that are just sort of like you need to do to keep yourself alive. Like everybody needs food, shelter, et cetera. Um, these are things that um, you have these desires because you're alive. And then um, he says, you know, it'd be easy to think that that's all of your desires, that all of your desires are conditional desires upon you living, right? But if you consider the case of a rational suicide, right, um, you can say, um, you know, in person, uh, take two people. Person one decides to, um, you know, follow through with a rational suicide. Person two doesn't. What person two has is some desire that is strong enough to keep them motivated and keep them living. So in that way, their existence is conditional upon having this desire, not the other way around, right? Um, and so, so these can be things like writing a book, oh, I've always wanted to see every national park, et cetera, right? You live for your family, these are categorical desires. But, so for him, he says that all of these would get old <laughs> eventually, right? Um, that everything that you like to do, eventually you're going to accomplish. Um, you'll never do as good as you possibly could have that one time. Um, or they'll get frustrated, you'll give up, and then you fall into prong two of that dilemma and you've taken on all new, all new desires, right? Um, but for my part, I want to argue that there's, there's plenty of, of perpetually satisfying categorical desires that we could go, go through. Um, so one common example is like if you um, want to write a, a history of every 20th century leader, like eventually you're going to run out of them, right? But if you wanted to write every, a, a book on the, the greatest leader of the last year, right, you would never run out of that material because there's always going to be a previous year. So you can see how some desires could possibly just continue, continue on. Um, so Nagel, I, I'm trying to like weave a little bit of a path here between Nagel and Williams in that Nagel says that immortality would essentially always be a good thing. Williams, that immortality would always be a bad thing. I want to say that this might not be for everybody, <laughs> um, as, as again, my wife reminds me in this, um, that you know, not, maybe not everybody would be equipped for um, you know, immortality, right? And, and this actually has some pretty big implications, Williams's argument um, in this, for a lot of the religions that sort of promise this. So if your religion doesn't also teach you to have perpetually satisfying goals, then maybe your omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient God is maybe lacking in one of these three areas if he's essentially, uh, or he or she is, is condemning you to an immortal, um, you know, a state of immortality after your physical death, right, is keeping you around, but you're going to end up in this state of torturous boredom, that that um, kind of has some implications there that might, might need to be addressed. Um, so Williams's argument in standard form, just eternal life will lead to achieving all your categorical goals. Um, you achieve or give up on all of these, you find new ones, um, or submit to an eternity of boredom. Um, these are the two, pro the, the two premises that I, I'm mostly taking issue with. Um, if you find new goals, then you're giving up, uh, and then your identity changes. This is uh, eternity of boredom would then be undesirable, um, so then eternal life is therefore uh, undesirable. Um, 
But for me, I, I think it's important to distinguish um, on two different types of immortality. So Williams just sort of defines it as a deathless state, right? But uh, a lean Macropolis dies, right? Um, a lot of this, um, if everybody's seen the, the Good Place, uh, a lot of this is based on um, Julian Barnes's um, uh, chapter in his book, um, The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters. And uh, <clears throat> so in both of these cases, these, these characters of the story supposedly have immortality, but eventually they die, right? So they're not actually you know, not subject to death in any way, right? So when I think of definition one of uh, being not liable of death, I think of more of like, um, like Plato's soul from the Phaedo is where like it's essentially life, so for it to die doesn't even make sense. Like it just would be you know, a contradiction in terms that this thing is essentially life for it to die. That, that just wouldn't even work out. So it is immortal for all time. But number two is just the way that we kind of talk about this immortality, it's just sort of the indefinite existence of a person. So this is more of like a contingent or sort of a modest version of immortality. Um, and I think that um, for Williams who approaches this from a point of like human desire, um, that this is really important because we tend to take things um, that are absolutely given as an absolute granted, just as people, right? So like who, who woke up super happy that the sun came up today, right? Who just woke up thrilled that the sun came up? It's not quite a granted, but it's almost a given in our lives, right? These are just sort of the things that sort of pass by just sort of unnoticed, right? So for us to be absolutely immortal, I kind of think that that would actually just sort of um, make us even not human anymore. So like Williams' you know, position of starting this from a point of human desires might not even make sense if we were just sort of absolutely immortal, right? Um, so for me, for us to place value or for something to be worthwhile, there has to be this degree of scarcity as well, right? And so this modest version of immortality gives us this indefinite existence, but also um, this degree of scarcity where that is something that we could then as people like ascribe value to. Um, and I know I'm coming up on my um, end of my time, but so these are just sort of like some archetypes for um, you know uh, types of people that I think would have perpetually satisfying desires, and some are a little kind of tongue in cheek. Um, and there's certainly a lot of overlap here, but and they don't necessarily have to be, say, a teacher or a soldier explicitly. But you can imagine somebody who you know, makes it their point in life to absorb wisdom, uh, sort of develop that, and then share that with others, right? Would that be something that could ever get old, right? In a, in a constantly evolving and changing world, that's a, that's a full-time job, right? And so that might be something that would keep at least some people going I indefinitely, right? Um, and I've gotten a lot of flack from Dr. Vitonsky in our class on this, and I think this is important for him to give this pushback, because he does not want immortality. And then after a few, I, I, I kind of broke him down. He was like, you know, he's like, I don't, sitting here now, want immortality. But I also don't think I would ever get to the point where I would decide, all right, today's the last day, right? He, think, he does think that he would kind of always want another day if he was given the option, but he also doesn't want immortality because it just seems oppressive when you think of the you know, infinite expanse of time. Um, and again, I just think you know, they th can be perpetually creative. Um, you know, just things like if you're involved in, say, like evolutionary study, like evolution isn't going to necessarily just run out, right? So if that's your interest and that's key to your personal identity as well, that you wouldn't run into prong two of Williams's dilemma and you could just stay in one and be satisfied without boredom. Um, so um, one reason why I think this is really important is that um, this is increasingly a um, less of a hypothetical issue and maybe becoming more of a practical one. So just a few years ago, some really fringe thinkers, um, gerontologists um, like Aubrey de Grey and then um, David Sinclair is a bi biologist, um, have developed um, and are developing um, you know, really um, impressive age-related uh, treatments, right? These are things that could possibly just keep you, right? Um, in a sort of a static state, right? Um, and so if the physicalist point of view that like Williams and uh, Kagan put out, then this is really a technical issue that can be solved. And so what like DeGray and Sinclair want to say is that the, the growth curve of our technology is, is about to take us to a point where we've effectively achieved immortality. Where the, the argument goes, you just need enough tech growth to kick it like 20 years down the line, and then you get 20 years of the most advanced technology growth ever, and then 20, 20, and, and you can sort of keep kicking this can down the lane indefinitely, right? Um, 
And there's a few different ways that you can kind of think of this, and I, is why I think the different definitions are important. So in, in Thought Experiment 1, you have these nanobots that once they start you know, keeping you alive, say they get injected in you, they'll never stop, right? So they're self-perpetuating, they're self-healing, you, you can't do anything to affect the nanobots. And once they're sort of put to test, they're going to keep you alive forever, right? So would you want this, or would this end up being you know, a prison that you've sort of assigned yourself to over time? Or like a super vaccine that just sort of stops your aging, but still allows you to have some type of accidental or like incidental death or like a rational suicide or something. And so you can imagine these like not too far-fetched technologies that are going to essentially grant you indefinite existence, but through two totally different means and to kind of think about what it is that we actually want. So um, I am pretty much at my time. So I just, wanted, there's a lot of like kind of practical implications I think for thinking of this sort of like what seems like kind of a pie in the sky, oh, would you want immortality or not, right? But really there's a lot of practical implications for sort of discussing uh, this topic. So um, again, um, thank you for your time um, and I'm happy to talk about any questions or concerns.